Hello, everybody, and welcome to 720 Degree Tennis. I'm your host, Bill Patton, and today on the show we have David Archer from Florida, who's actually a transplanted Northern California guy, and he's well noted for, in fact, we just established that he also is a Pied Piper uh, of tennis. I've actually been called that myself, which that's a very nice honor. So um, anyone who's interested in player attraction, conversion, and retention, this is going to be a great show for you. But first what we're going to do is we're going to get to know David some, and then we'll get into all that other good information. All right. So, David, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Bill. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited. Yeah, it's it's a fun thing to do, and um, you know I I I love getting to know different tennis pros from around the country and helping helping everybody get more exposure for the game. So, uh, tell us a little bit about you and where you grew up, and how did you get started with the game? Well, my father was a high school coach, so you can see um, I started at a very young age. Uh, he was my first coach and taught me a lot of stuff. I grew up in San Jose, California, and I started playing tournaments at the age of 12 in 1972, and it may have been 11. I wasn't ranked my first year in the age groups, but I was ranked in Northern California in 72, 74, 76, and 78. And so... When would you say that you developed your your love of the game? When did you know, I, I really love this and I want to do this forever? I have vivid memories of my dad taking me to the courts at a young age. And uh, we had a thrifty, kind of like Walgreens is today, but it was called thrifty. And um, we after we would hit, if we would hit enough balls in a row, Dad would take us there, and they had the over-the-counter ice cream. And we'd either uh, get a single, a single, a double, or a triple scoop, depending on how many balls we got in a row. Now, I had an older sister and a younger brother, so you can imagine the fun. <laughs> right, as you're eating your triple scoop while somebody gets none. And I or, think, yes, I was... I got a, I got a triple, you got a double. That's exactly right, and I think I was, uh, of all the siblings, I think, uh, you know, as far as playing, I, I was the little pit bull. You know, I, I didn't want anyone to ever beat me, so uh, both my siblings are to this day still in tennis, so my dad did a good job. In your development as a player, uh, what were, was there any pivotal moments where you had a dramatic improvement breakthrough or or maybe some adversity that you had to overcome? Well, my dad, being a high school teacher, could not afford private lessons for us. But he did have a wonderful thing happen to him in that some person that he knew gave him a ball machine. And he used the ball machine with me for a while, and then he found a local tennis pro in San Jose named John Reed, and John Reed had played on the professional circuit for a small amount of time. And he traded John Reed, that ball machine, for a series of tennis lessons for me. And that's where I began to experience a little uh, better coaching because my dad was only, well, in those days he would have been a C player, but nowadays it would have been a 3-0 or a 3-5. So he didn't have the experience to show me, but... John Reed certainly showed me a lot of things for two years. Okay, and so is there something that sticks in your mind, one thing that he taught you that was, you know, maybe a little different? He worked a little more on the form of ground strokes, and he taught me, I would think, my turn. So turning and preparing for uh, when you're playing with the green, the, the regulation ball, is so vitally important. And so I think it was the turn that John Reed taught me. And uh, one of the big pivotal moments in my life came when I got my first ranking. My birth date was September 24th. 
And in the 70s, it was still called the USLTA, by the way, <laughs> the United States <laughs> Lawn Tennis Association. And um, uh, the uh, in in those days, um, it was difficult. It was difficult to be ranked, and the birthday cutoff was October first. So I always right. turned eleven or twelve, thirteen or fourteen on September twenty fourth, which means I was always playing up a division. So to get ranked, I was always ranked in my second year, and it was a very difficult thing for me. And so it was exciting when I saw my book in the annual readout at the end of the year. And you know, it's funny, my my son, they switched it later that the cutoff was, you know, June, and then my, my son had the June birthday. And he was also small for his age, so he was just playing monsters his whole his whole t- junior tennis career. So tough tough duty, but uh, yeah, it's, it can be rough. And so so what was it about getting the ranking that that made such a difference to you? Well, it just makes you know that you belong where you are. I'm so thankful that today the the birthday issues are different. Because I feel like if I would have been born eight days later, I would have been ranked in the first year of the division instead of the second, which means I would have got seedings all through the second year, which means my rankings would have been higher. I have a quick story to tell about that, if that's okay. No, go ahead. Absolutely. I'm all about stories. (laughs) <laughs> in the, in 19 in 1976 in the the Northern California Sectional Championships in Berkeley I was in the second round I was unseated and I played a seated gentleman by the name of Bradley Gilbert and I lost the first set and I won the second set and we went to six all in the third set and I lost in the tiebreaker 5-3. And that's wow. just a classic example. I think if I would have been seated a little higher, things could have turned out a little differently. I wouldn't have had to play him well, in the second noticed, round. But. Just noticed that that was a nine-point tiebreaker. Yes, of course. Because you won 5-3. That's, that's awesome. You don't hear stories now, about the nine-point tiebreaker very much. I need to add one more thing to that for some reality okay. here, Okay. Let me ask you a question before you say that. Did you did you sure. play ugly or did he play ugly against you? I really want to keep the story right, and I don't want to uh, trash anyone on air. <laughs> but I did have well, to no, get he, a, a, he wrote a book called that. I don't. It's not a. Trash, I had to huh? get a. It was one of the ugliest things you'd ever want to see, and I he I had to get line judges for sure. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I understand. I understand. Okay, so I'm sorry. I, I'm kind of throwing off your story, so let's get back on track. So what did you want to finish okay. with? Okay. When I played number one for Cal State Hayward in 1981, we played a team called Foothill Junior College, and the number one player was Bradley Gilbert, and I had to play him. And he had grown a foot and a half. He was, you know, his six foot three. I think he was six three or six four. His dad was a monstrous man. And, um, you know, I'm 5'6", so it was David against Goliath, and unfortunately I didn't have a sling. And I lost 6-0, 6-0 that day. So that just shows you, you know, what occurs as as we mature as men. He he, he became a monstrous player. Well, and he, he definitely capitalized on his athleticism Without a doubt, because I mean, he really, he truly became a very smooth athlete on court, and that's what made it possible for him to do all the other stuff for sure. So, um, all right, well, that's you know, that's interesting. I mean, you know, it, it's always it's always fascinating how you can have these you know brushes with fame and meet up with people and have a have a great match with them, and then yeah, I realize hey, you're right there. That's that's pretty awesome. So now, um, as a player, so at, at Cal State Hayward, um, yeah, 
I don't know how much we want to talk about that, but that Stan Clark guy, do you want to speak a little bit about Stan Clark? Stan Clark was an awesome guy. I really enjoyed Stan as a coach. He didn't have a lot of knowledge of tennis, but he did the very best he possibly could with what he knew. I want to say sorry again to Stan. I dropped out after my junior year. But Stan was a great guy. He became the athletic director of Cal State Hayward, I think, the year after I left. And we had a great year that year. We were ranked top six in the nation, and we defeated Davis, UC Davis, in our league championship match. So we put a little notch in Stan's belt there. Okay, let me throw you a little future history at you, okay? I was I was a volunteer assistant coach at Cal State Hayward, and – and a 500, a 13 and 13 Cal State Hayward team was taking on a 30 and one UC Davis team, right? Davis was number one in the country in Division Two, but Cal State only had one league loss, and Davis had none. And it's the last match of the season, right? And it was still, it was still six singles and three full doubles matches, right? Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so that was still true. It was still two out of three sets for doubles. So, on the day there were seven three-set matches. And wow. Cal, and Cal State won five of them. Cal. Woo! But here's the, okay. Here's but here's the kicker. All right. There were nine tiebreakers. And Cal State won seven of the tiebreakers. Oh my right. gosh! And then, and then it with with Davis serving for the championship at five four. Uh, the two seniors who are playing in the doubles, and the match has been dedicated to them. Break, hold, break to win a share of the title. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's see, and that's and then, folks. I mean, if you're listening and you're like, "Wow, who cares?" That's Division Two college tennis. I mean, this is part of the drama of of the beauty of tennis when you're, you know, over there playing and nobody even knows what you've done, but you'll remember something like that forever. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, I'm only sharing that because we're both Cal State Hayward alums. So, all right. So now let's let's maybe maybe the listeners enjoyed that, but even if they don't, you and I did. So, okay, let's be self indulgent. Yes, we did. All right. Now, how did you how did you make the transition into coaching? When I was 12 years old, I did. When I was 12 years old, my dad ran all the recreational classes in East San Jose. And so they were rather large at the time. It was the 70s. It's when Jimmy Connors was dating Chris Everett. So everybody and their sister was playing tennis. So we had recreational classes sometimes of between 18 and 30 adults on the court. And it was just my dad. And so he would pull me out there to run courts for him at 12 years old. And he... He was a, um, it wasn't PTR then, uh, Dennis, he was a Dennis Vandermeer proselyte, my dad was. He knew Dick Gould and Dick Shivington, uh, who both got their start in high school tennis, by the way. My dad knew both of them. Gould obviously went on to coach Stanford, and Shivington went on to have a great career with Foothill Junior College. But... Um, my dad was was a proselyte of Dennis Vandermeer, and so we did a lot of the separating people uh, and bouncing the ball to themselves. Dennis Vandermeer was a big proponent of that, where these recreational people would would simply stand on part of the court and dribble the ball or bounce the ball in their rackets, and we called them skills drills. So that's how I cut my teeth in learning how to teach tennis. Yeah, well, and I think that that's, that's outstanding, and I, I use that with all of my beginners to this day. I mean, you know, we go downs, ups, and flip-flops, and 
And then we ask the kids, all right, what are you learning when you do that? You know, and they don't really know. <laughs> they don't, I mean, is this is this just a time <laughs> killer that the coach is having me do yeah. just because he needs to write on his clipboard? Or, you know, or because he doesn't want to have to teach that much during the lesson? So why don't, why don't you get into what are the things that happen when people do their downs, their ups, and their flip-flops, or whatever you want to call them? Can you ask that one more time? I'm sorry. Well, I, yeah, I mean, why don't, why don't we get into what, why don't we get into why are those skill builders and what skills are being established? I mean, I think that this is a great thing for, you know, let's speak to someone who's maybe a newer instructor to tennis and and or like going to be starting to coach a high school team and they might have a large number of beginners on their team and they want to they want to build their skills. So what? Give us the why. Why are, why are we doing downs, ups, and flip-flops? Well, we call it skills drills, and it's no different than when you take a young child to learn baseball or football or soccer. You don't set them on the field and have them kick a goal or hit a home run or uh, throw a 40-yard touchdown pass, you start with what we call the basics. And the basics become the absolute foundation of your game. And I recognize that when you watch a Roger Federer or any great pro on the court, they're spinning their racket. They're doing things with a tennis racket that normal human beings cannot do. And it all starts with what we call skills drills. Uh, I know you probably remember uh, and I'm guessing here, Bill, but I beat the heck out of my garage door at home when I was 10 and 11 years old, pretending I was Bjorn Borg. And, and all of that was skills drills oriented. So with the Dennis Vandermeer system, and I am a PTR certified pro because of my dad being that proselyte, we have not invented anything new. We've just made sure through these skills drills that every single child that we come in contact with can do these drills. I wrote a book called Eight Weeks to Tournament Tennis, and in it we highlight what we call a recipe for simple, successful progressions that produce a back-and-forth rally. And that's okay. what we are all about. Off for a second. Let me cut you off for a second because because the the answer that I really want here is when when you do the downs and ups and the flip flops, exactly what are you learning? You're learning continental grip. You're learning volley form. You're learning hand eye coordination. You're learning focus because we always make them do 10 in a row without missing. If they're doing the drill and they miss 10, they have to start it again. We're learning goal setting. We're learning accomplishing a goal, which all has to do with that individual sport of tennis that's so difficult. That's great. Let me, yeah, so... And I, I also, so with, you know, like smaller kids, you know, under the age of eight, yeah, ten in a row, that could be challenging. And with slightly older kids, you might even say, hey, let's do 25, 50, 100, you know. And then every once in a while I'll do something where I'll say, all right, let's see how many you can do in a minute. And then I'll crouch down really low and go, D -d 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 right? And then we'll see, who, you know, if they could cumulatively can do more than me. But um, the other thing I think also that I like to teach with that is that you're learning the feeling of the ball and the racket. And, you feel, and you'll feel how the ball feels different coming from the ground than it does falling from the sky. And when you do the flipping the racket over – then you're learning to adjust the angle of your racket so that you can control the ball. And the other thing we teach is terminology. So when they, we call them taps, when they tap a ball up with a forehand and it hits the ground and they tap it again, we call it ground stroke, a forehand ground stroke. When they turn the racket to the other side and do the taps with the backhand, we call it a backhand ground stroke. 
And when they do the flipping of the racket, we call it flip-flop ground strokes. And then we turn and we go, what is it called now when you do the same drills without the ball hitting the ground? Oh, that's called a volley. Okay, let's do 10 forehand volleys. Let's do 10 backhand volleys. And let's do the very hardest of the first six drills, which are the 10 flip-flop volleys. All right, so thank you for that. I mean, I think that that's going to help somebody. Um, and and I'm glad for that. But, you know, knowing why we do things and and being able to convey that to our students, that there's a reason why we do everything, that nothing that we do on the court is a waste of time, makes a more valuable experience for them overall. All right, now, um, so in terms of in terms of your uh, coaching philosophy, all right, um, how, how did that, I, mean, you, I guess your dad was most influential, right, and then John Reed and Dick Gould. Are there any others that come to mind that have helped guide your philosophy? There's a, a gentleman out of Northern California. His name is Chet Lissy. Chet Lissy, I met Chet Lissy. Um, he lives in Oroville, California to this day. And I met Chet Lissy when I was playing my freshman year of college tennis at Evergreen Junior College. In those days, the JCC colleges were split into two divisions. Division One, which would have been the Foothill Colleges and the, you know, the other colleges, the West Valleys and others in, in the Bay Area. And our division was Division Two. And um, I played for a small college called Evergreen Junior College my freshman year. And at that year, they had the state. They had a state tournament every year, and they crowned a state singles and doubles champion from different colleges. It was a pretty big deal, believe it or not, because it was a state title. And as a freshman, I got to the semifinals of the state championship and lost to a gentleman named Bo Toy. Bo Toy ended up playing number one for Cal Davis, and he went to the NCAA ones because they won the doubles championship in 81 for D2 that year, which is a pretty big deal. But anyway, um, during that tournament at Yuba City, Chet Lissy, I don't want to get him in too much trouble, but he sat down next to this young man named David Archer who had had a match point against Bo Toy in the semifinals of the state tournament, had a match point. And he sat down next to me, probably not legally, <laughs> And yeah. he said, young man, if you, if you come to my college next year, you will be the state singles and doubles champion. <laughs> and he was a big, he, he's a big guy. He's he's an African-American gentleman. He's six foot four, just a big guy. And the way he treated his players with, was which, with absolutely incredible discipline. And over the course of my life, I had played much better for disciplined coaches than undisciplined coaches, and so I saw him, I saw him as a as a father figure, and I made the choice. I wanted to get away from the family life. I was 20 years old, I think, and or 19, and so I made the trip up to Butte College the next year. And Chet Lissy taught me something. He taught me some of the very basics that we put into everything that we teach now. And that is the 10 balls in a row and the 20 balls in a row. Uh, I've written a book called Eight Weeks to Tournament Tennis, and the next one is 10 Balls to Better Tennis. And finally, I have a third book called 20 Balls to Better Tennis. And 20 Balls to Better Tennis I stole completely from Chet Lissy because that's what he focused on in his coaching of us. And he used to come to me at the fence and say, David, you hit 20 balls in a row in this point, and I guarantee you can hit the 21st ball as hard as you want, okay? And so I would do that, and I would win every point because it never went to 21 hits. Yeah, I think that's a, that's an interesting um, mindset adjustment. And do you think that that was unique to you, or or did he pretty much say that to everyone? I ended up winning the state singles and doubles championship that year. And Chet Lissy is one <laughs> Chet Lissy is one of those underground coaches that will never be famous. He goes to Ojai every 
single year. He has watched more tennis matches than any human being I've ever met. And he took teams that had no business to win state championships. He took these Northern California high school boys that were barely ranked in Northern California, and he turned them into state junior college. He won tons of junior college Division II state championships, if you look up the record. Wow. You know, okay, that brings up a really good point. There's a real problem of negativity from the so-called elite elite power structure of coaches that overvalues themselves and undervalues the Chet Lissies of the world. And I think that part of the solution of, of American tennis getting back to being on top is when, is when the Chet Lissies and the David Archers and the you know the the so-called unsung heroes are really truly valued. Everybody pulling together, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if you were a former Division One college player or if you were a top hundred pro or even top ten in the world. That stuff doesn't really matter. What really matters is can you really truly develop a player and bring them a significant uh, way along the path. And now my editorial is over. So, comments? Yes, I think you brought up an absolutely incredible point. And the way I like to think of it, Bill, is that there's planters, there's waterers and husbandmen of the field, and there's harvesters. I look at someone like a Nick Boletari as a harvester. He made his career by taking kids who were good and giving them an environment where they could be great. There's others that take kids like in a high school or junior college collegiate level and they take kids that have been planted in the sport and they water them and they husband them. In other words, they, the husbandman oversees his crops. They oversee these kids knowing that they're going to hand them on. That's high school and junior college. And then there are those that are planters. I am incredibly proud because I am a planter. I'm not necessarily a waterer or a husbandman or a reaper, but I am a planter. And my heroes are those people in the next years who put the most beginning, never have played tennis players into that into that field by planting. Those are my heroes. Yep. That's great. And I want to I want to echo that but in a different way. You know, I, I every once in a while I go back and I kind of look at how many of my former players played, you know, at a certain level and you know, I'm very happy with the fact that that you know, over 50 of my players have gone on to play college tennis. It might even be a bigger number than that. But what I do know for certain is that an even greater number have gone on to teach tennis. And so and what has a greater impact? So I'm much more proud of the fact that that players that I've worked with have gone on to give back to the game um, than I am that they achieved a certain level of play. We formulate the future of tennis not necessarily by our stars or the ones that rise up and become these incredible players. But we formulate the future of tennis by making sure that every single child we're sowing into gets the very best that we have every single day. In the book that I wrote, Eight Weeks to Tournament Tennis, we talk about career-minded people, that there are many more career-minded tennis players that you'll raise up than top 100 stars. And so we talk about the importance of all the foundational basics to the people that we teach. All right. So you know what? Let's go further into your book and and talk more about, um, you know, the planting, the watering, and the husbandry and whatnot. But it, it seems like, though, at each step along the way that that we're going to – we need to focus on, you know, not only – the attraction to the to the game and attraction to the next level, right? But conversion 
and retention. I mean, we have to make it possible for people to get to the next level. I, I, I heard some. I heard a, a statistic that out of every twelve kids who who begin tennis, um, one will move on to take another tennis class, and then out of twelve who do that, then one will become an intermediate tennis player. And if they become an intermediate tennis player, then they more than likely will continue. So that means one out of 144, right? So so I decided to make it my goal that two out of 12 <laughs> would go on to that next class. And we started to do even better than that. But, um, you know, so... I think it's good to start with that as realizing that's what the baseline is and how can we go better than that. Now, tell us your your method. Let's go into detail about your book and how you how you approach that. It's a very simple philosophy and Bill, I know it's one that you adhere to. Just hearing you talk, we are so like minded in that area. And I Absolutely. think the future is gonna I think the future is going to see us like-minded people um, doing bigger and bigger things because the sport has suffered. I think we can admit that. I've heard of the statistics of maybe 12,000 juniors right now participating in competitive tennis across a nation that has 700 million people. And to me, that just doesn't cut the mustard. As far as our philosophy is concerned, I really do like to go after the Marines' motto. And the Marines' motto was, not one left behind. So when we teach our tennis, it is incredibly grievous to us if a child walks away from the programs once they're involved. And I have to be honest, in my last memories, um, for the last three or four years, I don't think I've experienced a child walking away once they join our programs. And one of the reasons is we develop our programs from the second that a child steps on our court. There are some realistic goals for that child. The day and age of the three-year forehand has gone by the wayside. And we get these kids to play in fun, competitive tournaments within eight, and that's why we called the book Eight Weeks to Tournament Tennis. We teach them uh, from the very beginning. Um, at the last club that I taught at here in Florida, we had a three-year-old who was going to play uh, the first Grand Prix, Junior Grand Prix tennis event when they were four. And... <laughs> She's okay. off the charts. All I got to do is tell you she's off the charts. Now, my son, who plays for the University of Utah, Justin Archer, I have video proof of him rallying 20 regulation tennis balls because they didn't have the softer balls uh, from half court at two and a half years old. I have video wow. proof. It's in my archives. So the whole thing that we base it on is skills, drills, and like I said, a recipe of simple, successful progressions that produce a back-and-forth hit. And our whole system from the very beginning is based on this. Drop, feed, rally three, play Grand Prix. From the moment that these three, four, and five-year-olds hey, get on my court. Wait a that they, was too fast. They, that was fast. I'm a, I'm a okay. slow listener. All right. Okay. So but yeah. we say drop, drop, feed, rally three, play Grand Prix. Nice. And okay, let me let me take it. Let me go on a little tangent here for a second. I went to a four-hour uh, thing with Judy Murray. So it was a four-hour specialty course, and she's awesome. I just really admire her a lot. And I, it's too bad Andy acts so horribly at times, but. Uh, she's fantastic, and so she's working with these six and seven year old kids, and and she's working on the volley, and the one kid's kind of not quite doing it right, and she says, you know, yeah, you can do it like that, but you're not going to beat Rafa Nadal like that. 
you know. And then she'll teach the proper form, and then yeah, now you have a chance. And then she, she'll drop a little comment. Oh yeah, kids, it's we're doing tour training. And so yeah, I mean what we're doing here, you know, if you keep with it, you can play the tour. And I love that because because you're feeding the vision, right? And and you know they adopt that, and then you you know you it's, it's almost. It's almost brainwashing, but what it is, it's really opening up um, something to them, an opportunity, and making it limitless for them. So I want, so that I think is a similar thing to what you're doing, and I just wanted to say I think it's awesome. Okay, so let's, what's the next thing after that? Well, we we pride ourselves in taking these three, four, and five year olds, especially the five year olds and prepping them to play what we call the Junior Grand Prix Tennis Event, and that's called JGPT. It's, I know you've probably done some spots on your show about it, but once I got involved with the JGPT, I completely had a goal and a focus for every single child that stepped on my court, where before, as we taught, we the goal was so far in the future that it was difficult to keep kids engaged. So when these three- and four-year-olds see a five-year-old play their first Grand Prix uh, tennis event, they understand everything that we're doing. And everything we do with the kids is focused on their ability to play their first Junior Grand Prix tennis event. And the reason is we have another motto, and it's... um, those that um, play quickly stay in the sport longer. So the quicker they play, the quicker they play, the longer they stay. Yeah, no, I'm I'm totally with you on that. And uh, yeah, I mean, and and you know, for how many years? I mean, it's been 20 years that that more and more that we've known that that, um, you know, tennis is the only sport where you continually practice and never play. And yet people continue to go that path. I mean, just because of, I don't know, laziness, uh, lack of initiative or whatnot. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's vital. I mean, why kids want to play the game. Uh, here's, a, here's a funny thing. From coaching high school, um, based on that philosophy, I decided that I, no matter what team I was coaching, we would have the the maximum amount of matches that you could legally have, including the two scrimmages you could have. Yeah, and kids love that. Kids love that. Yeah. they get to play a match, and they don't have to. And as much as you know, I'm, I might be a fantastic speaker and and a terrific coach. They don't really want to practice. They want to play. So, you know, now, and, and they really love I'd like, playing 24 competitions in one season. I want to speak to that real quick. The other day I went to my club to teach the afternoon kids, and they have a huge after-school program at this HOA, Homeowners Association. And over the corner of the courts, I could hear this incredible tumult and excitement and things going on, and I was drawn to it. And it was a group of supervised kids, one teacher, and they were playing a game of stickball. I call it stickball, but it was a tennis racket and an old tennis ball. And one kid was pitching, and all the kids really needed to know was there was a first, second, third, and home base, and that if you hit the ball and you run without, you know, the baseball rules of throwing to first and getting you out at the plate, that you score and then your team wins. There was absolutely no technique being taught. The only things that were being encouraged were who's ahead and who isn't. I I wish I would have recorded it. I have never seen so much fun and so much excitement in my life. And again, I realized in my heart that my goal as a coach was to teach kids to compete and have fun, not so much to teach them the technique because I'm a planter. I'm not a harvester, 
and I'm not a waterer or a husbandman over the field. I'm a planter. And my job as a planter is to teach kids how extremely fun and exciting competing in tennis is. Yes. Okay, so back to the book. Um, now, um, one of the one of the keys to being able to sell some books is to give a little free content. So, without giving away too much, I mean, I want I want people to really look into your book for sure. But give us a give us a taste of what's in there that that is going to be so helpful for people in growing their programs and retaining more kids. Well, first of all, I want to say the book has not officially come out yet, and it will okay, be out. So we'll call this pre-launch, all right? But so yep, you've got a yep, pre-launch. And, okay, the, the, the first chapter of the book is how to plant the love of tennis in a child's heart. And the way we do that is just like what I said. Kids absolutely love to play. They love to compete. When they step on the court, we don't simply want them to compete because they have to have a little tiny bit of technique in order to hit the ball over the net. But again, we take them through a series of what we call 10 ball drills to be able to accomplish a back-and-forth rally. Again, like I said before, the recipe of simple, successful progressions that produce a back-and-forth hit. Uh, and we outline every single one of those. We outline where the children are going to stand on the court. We outline the warm-up drills. We call them alley-to-alley drills, where we line up every child in the alley. They do the alley-to-alley warm-ups. We let them participate by picking the next drill that we're going to do, and it goes on from there. Yeah. Let me throw a couple things in there, too. Um and uh, I'll even give you permission if you want to use these, all right? So um, I've, I have this little thing called that we call mini-match, and it might be played by four- and five-year-olds. And so, so I, and I use this with kids who I can tell they have a low tolerance for lesson time and that they want to play, but, but they don't have the hand-eye coordination or really much in the way of technique. So... So the way it goes is that we'll play with an orange or a red ball, and all they have to do to make sure they don't lose the point is for their racket to touch the ball. But so, I'll, so we'll have two different kids in the short court, and and I'll feed one a ball, and if they touch it, then the next feed goes to the other player, and if they touch it, then it goes to the other player and back and forth. But if they swing and miss, then their opponent gets a point. Mm. And and then the other thing that we do is if they, if they successfully hit it over to the other side, then they begin to realize that that gives them a huge advantage in causing the other player to miss. And we'll play to three points. And it's amazing how long the game can go because no points are scored because they continually – touch the ball with their racket, and then they feel successful. I haven't told them that that's a bad, that's a miss hit. You know, they don't they don't know about miss hits are bad yet. Um, so that's one thing I do. And we'll play a three, and they have fun, and then we switch sides because maybe it was the wind, you know. Uh, so then the other one is um, is we play a little thing I, with called the technique game uh, because – because some kids are so focused on the winning and the losing that everything you just taught them goes out the window. And they'll hit it any way they think they possibly can because their mind is so focused on the outcome. So the way that goes is I make a feed, and if on their very initial shot they show good technique, then they get a bonus point, and they will also get the next feed for the next point. But if they have poor technique, it doesn't matter if they hit the ball in or out. They don't get a bonus point, and the next feed will go to the other kid. So it's a little operant conditioning of using better technique, but then also we are playing so it's not Dullsville. So, um, and those are trade secrets, but I guess it's out now. <laughs> 
like we said before, one of the uh, last tennis directors that I worked for told me that, David, you're not doing anything new, but what you're doing, you do so well, and it's so perfect for the kids. Uh, you know, he used to tell me that all the time. We don't do anything new. I played, the, if you and I, Bill, were ever on the, the same court together for any amount of years, we would revolutionize the world, by the way, in tennis. <laughs> Um, because we do exactly the same things. We have, again, when we talk about um, the progressions that are simple and successful, that's exactly what you're doing. And our game is called the hit and catch game. And it's actually exactly when we do our JGPT tournaments red ball, there is no overhand serve. There is no underhand serve without the ball touching the ground. It is a one-try drop and hit the forehand over the net serve. So when we teach our four- and five-year-olds and even our three-year-olds how to play a hit-and-catch match, the one person drops the ball and hits it over the net, and the other person has to catch it. Now, if they miss the first time and the ball is still bouncing, they can still catch it. But if the ball rolls, then they lose the point. Got we it. play... Yeah. First person to four, which mimics 15, 30, 40, sudden victory at deuce, and then we switch people. And so that's, that's, that's the last phase just before our drop, feed, rally, three, play, grand prix. And I want to say yeah, one thing to so that. That's awesome. We always... okay, now, yeah, let me interject for a second because I've got something. I have a nugget here. My One of my favorite things about that is, the argument that happens about whether it was rolling or not. It was it was still bouncing. No, 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 no. It was rolling. I am the ultimate judge. I am the <laughs> I am the tournament referee and they do not get to argue with me when I said it rolled. But then you know, <laughs> technically though, if they understand <laughs> physics, it's always bouncing. So that's kind of a it's a gray area. But now okay, we're running out of time. We have less than eight minutes left, and what I really want to do is shift the focus fully on to Junior Grand Prix Tennis because that's the whole reason why we're talking here, really. So um, one thing that comes out that you've already said is that, okay, you've come up with a way that you play, and Junior Grand Prix Tennis allows you to do that. So you, you're playing matches with no serve. Perfect, right? Works for you. Works for me. I might not do it that way, right? And But Junior Grand Prix trusts you. So now tell us a little bit more about how Junior Grand Prix fits with you and how it fits with other people in your area. Well, one thing I love about Junior Grand Prix is you get to completely modify the tournament to who signs up. It doesn't mean that you have to know every single player that comes, but through the systems that I work, whenever we run a Grand Prix, we get 25 to 30 of our own kids from our own club to play. So it's very easy for me to adjust the way the tournament is played to get the maximum benefit out of it. Well, and okay, and that's that's awesome because, you know, maximum benefit for who? Maximum benefit for everyone involved. Yeah. That's my goal. So, so let's look at some of the other tournaments that are played. So you get... You get a single elimination tournament, and half the kids lose their first match. The average score of a junior tennis match is 6-0. Now, I'm sorry, the most common, the most common score of a junior tennis match is 6-0. And so the scenario I hate is uh, pe people drive an hour and a half, go and play a single elimination tournament, lose in 45 minutes, and now drive an hour and a half home for 50 bucks. Thank you for your money. No shirt. No shirt. Goodbye. We wonder why tennis has not grown where we need it to grow. I want to give you a classic example. Last weekend, I ran a junior Grand Prix event. We had eight people in the starter orange ball. There was a, woman, a young girl that came, and the pro sent her prematurely, I have to admit that. We always want it. We want to err in Junior Grand Prix on not quite ready, better than erring on 
the three-year forehand, if that makes sense, okay? No, I, I so got this you. Girl, I, we all understand this, what you mean, yeah. This girl showed up. She had barely ever played tennis and did not understand what an overhead serve was. The pro did not do the right thing with her. I was monitoring because I have monitors on every red ball court and every orange ball court. There's a monitor on every court. Once they get to green ball in the 14s and 12s and 16s, we do a more of a roving umpire like the USTA. I immediately saw her need and went to her. She didn't know how to score. She didn't know how to serve. I let the opponent know that we were going to let her bounce the ball on the ground and hit a forehand into the proper box for a serve and that we were going to play that way especially for Jordan. I followed Jordan every step of the way. She played six matches. She didn't win a single game. And at the end of the tournament, I presented her with a movie pass for being the best behaved sportsman because she had not won a match, and yet I had not heard one complaint out of her mouth. And not ever having played a tournament nor having served overhead, she went home as her family watched her triumphantly with a prize. And they have joined the very next tournament again where we will do the same thing until she understands exactly how to score and play. Wow. Uh, is there, I think we have to stop right there because that's what it's all about, right? And I want to comment. I'm tempted to want to comment on that and analyze that, but I just need to stop. Because I think you know, any, anyone, to the listening, anyone listening, make your own interpretation, right? And if you've got a brain in your head and you have a beating heart, you know, then you get it. So, all right. So let's uh, let's wrap this up. What um, if we, you know from this conversation? What are the two or three you know take homes? You know, or we might even let you have a fourth one if you really need it. But what? how would you summarize what we said here today? Figure out, as pros and coaches and parents, how to have your child fall in love with tennis. In the first chapter of my book, we make this statement. The awestruck lover will outwork the dedicated worker every time. Mm. Kids yeah. who learn to love tennis will learn all the technique that you need. Kids that love tennis will play tournament after tournament after tournament. Kids that love tennis will play till they're 92. But when you're building up dedicated workers, they're going to burn out, they're going to have broken dreams, and they're not going to fulfill the destinies that they have in their lives. Okay, 90 seconds. So let me okay, – now, here's, here's an interesting – all right. Um, I, I also have another book called Playing Sports Right Your Way, which is a general sports book, and I would like to work to see if we can somehow promote those two books together because I think my book can also help kids from other sports choose tennis because it's – because it offers so much more, all right? So – in 30 seconds, give us one more take-home. Error. If you're going to make an error on a child playing a tournament, error in that they're not ready. Don't error in the two- to three-year forehand format. It's going to be very difficult to hold on to them for that long. Kids do not want to learn technique. You, you, they want to compete. Rafael Nadal's forehand following through behind his head would not have been taught 15 years ago. And he was able to develop that because his uncle Tony allowed him the liberty to do so. Yeah. All right, very good. Hey, David, how can people reach you? Give us, why don't you give us an email address that someone could send you an email if they want to follow? D, as in David, W-A, as in Apple, M as in Mary, A as in Apple, N as in nothing. So that's Dwaman at sbcglobal.net. 
All right, very good. And I will post that on the um, on the web version of this um, thing here. So anyway, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming on the show. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciated getting to know you and, yes, yeah, seeing how like-minded we are. So thanks again. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. All right, take care. All right, everybody. So that was amazing. And uh, thank you, David, for coming on the show. And, um, you know, I am looking for people to sign up for my email list at patentschooloftennis.com. Go to the main page. I have some free stuff to send you. And I'm not sending it to anybody who doesn't sign up. So free stuff. I think you're going to like it. So we'll see you the next time. Next week, actually, no, I'm not going to talk about next week's show. (laughs) Bye.